most family people a choice between living downtown and moving to the suburbs, they're going to take the suburbs every time. Why wouldn't they? More room, better services, and most of all, the suburbs are safe. At least, they're supposed to be. When a terrible crime takes place in a nice neighborhood, you have to ask yourself, was it an act of random violence? Or could there be a problem in the home? In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there, somewhere in the first 72 hours. Just a few miles east of Seattle, Washington, Bellevue police receive a 911 call. Officer Jim Kowalsik responds. The radio dispatcher advised that some people had come home and they found bodies covered in blood. I was actually the second officer to arrive on the scene. The first officer had gotten there moments before me. And he was talking to two young males uh, out in front of uh, the house. Atif Rafay and his friend Sebastian Burns say they just found Atif's family dead in their home. They say they also heard noises. The killer may still be inside. So we kind of pushed the door open and just listened, you know, list, using our senses, uh, watching, trying to hear, even smell to see uh, was there anything to give an indication of what was going on or had gone in, in, in the house and we decided to go upstairs. We went up to the top of the landing and again stopped just to listen and watch and uh, see what we could see. What we saw was a man's body on a bed. On the wall behind the, the bed itself was a massive arc of blood and tissue. A very bloody scene. Uh, the man was obviously deceased and he had no face. Beside the bed, there's an open wallet. My inclination was that this was someone that had just shot their, their, their head off with a shotgun. Like they just put their wallet down because they're not going to be able to recognize me, laid on the bed and blew my head off. The police continue their search. Down the hall, they hear a noise. Officer Kowalsik finds a second victim, a young woman. She's bleeding from a head wound, but still alive. He calls for paramedics. The young woman is rushed to hospital, but the search is not over. So then we went back and down the stairs. I hear Paul yell, I've got another one. The back of her head covering was soaked in blood. Police have found three victims, but no intruder. They returned to the dead man's room. Both Paul and I had thought, okay, this person had killed the two women, then went and laid on the bed and blew his head off. And his, his hand was up here by his, by his face, and we thought, well, maybe it was like a very powerful handgun. A 44 Magnum could cause that damage. The only problem is no gun can be found. Something's wrong. If this was a homicide suicide, then somebody moved part of the evidence. I asked the officers that were sitting in, in the car with Atif and Sebastian to ask them if they moved anything. The boys insist they touch nothing inside the house. If that's the case, police are looking at a multiple murder. Homicide detective Bob Thompson arrives to take charge of the investigation. When I initially went in, I went downstairs, and uh, that's when I observed Mrs. Raffae. Thompson soon determines how Atif's mother was killed. She had two blows to the head. One was uh, in the back of her head, and the other was uh, just over her ear. 
Thompson also finds a VCR has gone missing from the family's home entertainment center. In Atif's sister's bedroom, Thompson notes something else. Just uh, a general observation of that room, there had been what looked like a struggle. There was impact where a weapon had hit the wall. She was fighting for her life in that room. In the master bedroom, Atif's father had no chance to put up a fight. It was clear that he was asleep at the time of the murder, and he never knew what hit him. He had been hit in the face numerous times, and I would just guess, you know, 40 to 50 times. The attacker never missed. On the carpet, Thompson finds a circular pattern of blood. It's about the same size as the top of a baseball bat. What you have is what initially looked like a burglary, which seemed incredible. It, I mean, that somebody come in in the middle of the night and steal a VCR and kill an entire family. Atif Rafay tells Detective Thompson he can't think of anyone who would want to hurt his family. They moved to Bellevue from Vancouver four months ago. His father, Tariq, was a structural engineer. His mother, Sultana, gave up her career as a dietitian to take care of his sister, Bosma, who's autistic and hasn't spoken since she was four. Atif explains that he's on summer break from university. He's been staying at Sebastian's house in Vancouver. They just drove down for a visit five days ago. He seemed to be very disengaged, I guess would be a, a word, which isn't all that uncommon for someone who's just observed the trauma of his entire family being murdered. Atif must now contact relatives and make funeral arrangements. Thompson is sympathetic. I had the impression that he just didn't want to deal with any of this. And ultimately, what we did was we said, you know what? You know, you've been up all night long. We're going to put you up in a, a, a local hotel, and you need to get some sleep. We'll come back and talk to you later. Thompson needs to send the boys' clothes to the lab. He has Officer Kowalsik bring them some new clothes. At first, Sebastian and Atif resist. Thompson explains they walked through the crime scene. Forensic analysis of their clothing is standard procedure. It's been a long night. When Thompson returns to his office, he gets a call from the hospital. Bosma Rafay has succumbed to her injuries. She was the only witness to the murders, and now she's gone. of the Rafay family have just been found murdered in their Bellevue, Washington home. The sole survivor, Atif Rafay, says he was out with his friend Sebastian Burns at the time of the murders. Both have given statements the police must now verify. The pair say they left the Rafay's house at 8.30 and drove to Seattle, where they had coffee and dessert at a local restaurant. They left the cake restaurant walked across the street, went and saw a movie. They went to the 950 showing. After the movie, they said that they went to a all-night cafe. According to the waitress, they arrived there about 10 minutes to one. She says she remembers Atif and Sebastian very well. Sebastian was talkative and charming. He asked if there were any good nightclubs nearby. She suggested the weathered wall, just a few blocks away. They left her a big tip. Twenty minutes later, they came back to use the restroom. Sebastian told her the club was closed. They left the all-night cafe at 1.30 and drove back to Bellevue. Sebastian's 911 call was logged at 2.03. The boys' statements check out. The lab finds nothing unusual on their clothing. Detective Thompson has Officer Kowalsik drop by the motel to see how the boys are doing. 
And it looked like the light was on, so I knocked on the door, and Sebastian came to the door. He was wearing nothing but his uh, underwear, no shirt, and I noticed back in behind him was a thief standing there in his jockey shorts. I, I can't speculate anything other than they felt I was an intruder. I just asked him if everything was okay, do you need anything, and it was uh, Sebastian was obviously in charge, in that, at least in that room, and he just said, nope, we're fine, uh, leave us alone. The door was slammed in my face, so I left him alone. Kowalsik tells Detective Thompson about the boy's behavior. Thompson says he finds something else odd. The first four nights the boys were in town, they stayed home and watched TV. Why so much activity on the night of the murders? We decided, you know what, let's just wait. The following day was going to be the funeral. We had family coming into town, uh, and they may be able to provide some more insight into who may be responsible. The next day, Thompson sends a forensic team to the Raffae house to gather more evidence. Lead forensic investigator, Kay Sweeney, zeroes in on the blood on the floor. I noted there was a drip pattern. It didn't look like a wound because it was fairly infrequent blood dripping, so it was more probably a weapon, some implement that was bloody that was dripping. The drops of blood lead from Tariq Rafay's bedroom to every outside door in the house. That indicates someone is checking to see the doors are locked. Uh, more likely than someone intends to spend some time inside the residence. And one of the reasons for spending time on the scene, beyond searching for valuables and taking them, is to clean up. Sweeney sprays leucomalachite on the bathroom walls. Green would indicate the presence of blood. And when I sprayed that shower stall, it lit up like a Christmas tree. Green specks all over the walls. Clearly, someone covered in blood took a shower here. In examining the bathroom, of course, I'm interested not only in the blood spatter and blood stains, but also if there's any hair. Sweeney finds a light brown hair that may well belong to the killer. In Tariq Rafay's bedroom, Sweeney analyzes the blood spatter to see what else he can find. I used straight line angle determination and determine an arc of swing. And in, term, in determining that arc of swing, then I can determine the height of a person swinging the bat. And the height of that person, uh, based on the arc of the swing, was six feet or more. Sweeney believes he now knows two things about the killer. He's six feet tall, and he has light brown hair, just like Sebastian Burns. I advise the investigators not to let the two boys out of their sight. Thompson sends an officer to the funeral to keep an eye on the boys. But Atif and Sebastian don't show up. We went back to the hotel, found that they weren't at the room, and um, it was a short time later we learned that they had just crossed the border into Canada. They were bound for Vancouver from Seattle on a Greyhound. 72 hours after the murders, Detective Thompson's prime suspects have fled the country. are looking for Atif Rafay and Sebastian Burns, the two prime suspects in the Rafay family murder case. The day after they fled the United States, Detective Bob Thompson arrives in Vancouver, BC. We contacted the local agency there to let them know we were in town. And uh, we were going around with them. They were helping us out with addresses. Thompson learns the boys are staying at a high school friend's condo. The detective wants to know why Atif and Sebastian disappeared. Do they have something to hide? Sebastian is outraged at the insinuation. He says he and Atif have done nothing wrong. We wanted hair and uh, blood samples from Burns and Rafay that we could use to match things that we would found at the crime scene. And ultimately, our conversations with them broke down to the point that they wouldn't speak to us. We found that no matter where we went, they were telling other people, don't talk to the police. Detective Thompson decides to visit Atif and Sebastian's old high school. One particular school teacher enlightened us, and she said, 
that they were arrogant people that would cause trouble for other people at their expense, which didn't mean that they were murderers, but it wasn't painting a picture that was very attractive either. That's not the only thing Thompson learns. Looking through a year-old high school annual, Sebastian Burns had been in a play that was called Rope. Rope is based on the famous Leopold and Loeb case, in which two young male lovers attempt to commit the perfect murder. When you read something like that, I mean, that, I mean, that piques your interest. Forensic psychologist Stephen Hart is familiar with the case. T. Fer Fay and Sebastian Burns actually developed a friendship in high school um, where they saw each other as having somewhat complementary skills or abilities. On their own, individually, uh, they may have been uh, a little bit of, of uh, an outcast, a little bit of a loser. It seems like once they hooked up, they started to develop a real sense of power. Rafay and Burns have been getting a lot of media attention in Vancouver. The uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, were reading in the newspapers about a couple of murder suspects running around in Vancouver. We met with the RCMP and told them about the case investigation that we had. They wanted to know what the Bellevue Police Department needed from them. The RCMP know that even though the murders were committed in the United States, they may well have been planned in Canada. The RCMP are happy to help. They set up a sting operation and put their man in place. The RCMP operative introduces himself as Frankie. He says he recognizes Sebastian from all those articles in the papers. Sebastian tells Frankie it's all a crock. He's innocent. After a few drinks, Sebastian says he and his friend Atif plan to make a movie about two young men who have been wrongly accused of murder. But movies are expensive, and Sebastian has no money. No one will hire him right now because of all the bad press. Frankie says he has underworld connections. If Sebastian wants to come work for him, he can make some easy money. Over the next several months, the undercover officer immerses Sebastian and Atif in a make-believe world of money laundering and drugs. Frankie then springs the trap. He says he has a job for them. If they eliminate a rival drug dealer for him, he'll pay them, big time. But first, he needs to know if the accusations are true. Are they killers? After stonewalling for months, Atif and Sebastian are eager to open up. Not only did they confess to it, but they were laughing about it when they were confessing. They showed no remorse at all. Um, they, they showed no um, emotion. In the police video, Atif explains how they planned everything to the last detail. It was to be the perfect crime. They bought tickets to the 950 movie, but they never intended to see it. Instead, they slipped out the exit and immediately returned to the Rafay house to commit the murders. They knew Atif's father would be asleep by that time. Sebastian is the stronger of the two. He would do the dirty work. They strip down to their underwear to avoid getting blood on their clothes. Atif's mother was an embarrassment to him. She'd thrown away her life to look after his feeble-minded sister. It made him sick. Atif's father was a devout Muslim who opposed his choices in life. Atif wanted to make movies. His father wanted him to be an engineer. Sebastian boasts how smart he and Atif were. They left his artistic sister for last because they knew she couldn't cry out for help. Then they got in the shower and washed away all traces of the murders. 
or so they thought. When they went to the all-night cafe, they deliberately left a large tip, so the waitress would remember them. At 2 a.m., they returned home to discover the horrific murders. Then they called 911. Frankie asks how it felt. They say killing the family was inconvenient, but it had to be done. They needed financing for their movie, The Great Despisers. The Rafay's insurance policies and the estate was worth uh, nearly half a million dollars. In order for Atif Rafay to get access to the inheritance, his entire family had to die. Money may be um, the manifest motive, but the latent motive is really about taking power and control, exerting power and control in the family. In a sense, taking out the existing power structure of a family. They despised other people. They wanted to feel superior to other people. They wanted to feel separate and apart and distinct from other people. Now they will be. Atif Rafay and Sebastian Burns will spend the rest of their lives in a Washington state penitentiary. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case.